Some time ago I made a video about a K6 system it didn't quite work out. It was since replaced with one which did work and we did look at that and actually we saw it not that long ago when we were testing the Trident Blade. But at the time of the crappy K6 I stated my disappointment at the TMC motherboard I'd used as well as stating how good one of their older boards had been. I've since obtained another one of those older Pentium boards and today we're going to have a quick look at it. Well hello everybody, I'm High Treason, long time no see. I was busy hand raising mice, unfortunately they died because the cheap shit heat pad, which was the only one I could get, broke while I was sleeping and they froze to death basically, which isn't good but, well, no point getting upset, you can't change the, the past at the end of the day. A lot of hours spent, so uh, yeah, uh, all for nothing, poor little things. but. I, I spent years looking for this, this model of motherboard, and I, I suppose it's not really remarkable, but it's a board I used to earn, and I always wanted another one. Whether it's any good or not is kind of besides the point. I just wanted another one, because I, I had fond memories of it. But I do remember it being good. I started testing it out, but I'm like, I don't know if my sample size is really big enough, and I just did more and more motherboards. And in the end, I was just like, you know what? Let's just make some hardware porn with this. I don't even know what goal there is to this video. Let's just make some fucking hardware porn at this point. Let's look at some different Socket 5 and 7 motherboards. We'll benchmark them against each other, I guess, but I'm not going to be reading the results out. And just see how they compare. I do think this one's probably for the server market, though, so that might have an impact. I guess I'll talk more about that later. Let's have a look at the bloody things. This is my old TMC PCI 54ST. It hasn't worked in over a decade. These boards featured the dreaded barrel battery of death, and this board took far too much damage to be feasibly repaired. Mostly it seems acid got into the chipset somehow and probably rotted it out from the inside. The replacement also had a barrel battery and some rot, but gravity was kinder to this one in that the acid flowed the other way and only really rotted the RTC circuitry away, leaving more important components intact. After removing the battery and removing the charging diode, as oddly even the external battery header would provide a charging current on this board with that in place, then also replacing a few minor parts, the first time I've ever had to replace the 32.768 kHz crystal for the real-time clock on any motherboard ever, this thing was good to go. For years I swore this board was good. It bloody better have been, because it cost me three figures to get hold of this, but it's the only other one I've ever seen, so... But I could afford to do it this one time, because thanks to certain other endeavours, I was still in the green from dealing with scrap and flipping a couple of things around. For years I swore this board was good. That it was fast. But time has a strange way of distorting things and erasing memories that aren't so good. So I wondered if this was simply a case of rose-tinted nostalgia goggles. After all, I spent hours on this thing building levels for blood that you'll probably never play and that's probably for the best unless somebody still has them out there in the wild but I've never seen them. And all of that blood mapping was done with a 75 MHz Pentium. Those often struggle to run the game so, well who really knows, maybe my tolerance to poor frame rates was better back then, it seems to be the case as time moves on, that we used to be more tolerant to it when we just didn't have much of a choice. It is a slightly unusual motherboard though, if only for the fact it offers both dip sockets and a curse slot for the cache. The cache stick has a jumper on it which suggests you can use both at the same time, but other sources suggest you can't. I suppose we could try it, as it likely wouldn't destroy anything if we did try, but that's for another day and I'd have to do some probing to make absolutely certain. I don't really want to blow this board up, but if the worst it's going to do is prevent it starting up until we remove the cache chips, then, well, I'm not really going to worry and maybe we should test it out, or maybe I will and just report back on it. I don't think it would be a very interesting video, to be honest, doing that. Notably, this board does not appear to support burst cache. In fact, I could find no such option and it never mentions it, so you're stuck with regular asynchronous write-back cache. More akin to what you'd find on a 486 board, I guess, and it should be just fine. 
The board also has the SIS 55 10 chip sets which are quite early in the realms of Socket 5 systems which this is for all intents and purposes despite saying Socket 7 because you need a VRM to install a real Socket 7 chip. But this board at least does offer the option. Strangely this one has jumpers whereas my original one had a little passive VRM card which is about the best you could hope to find. However I know that TMC provided this card so I guess they were making cost cutting measures by the time they got around to this board. And of course as stated the SIS chipsets on here are a little bit older, those date back to the Socket 4 days so I do imagine that's going to have some kind of impact on performance. You may think this board looks similar to the ECS SI55P in my current K5 system, and you'd be right, it really does. It's one of the reasons I chose that board. I won't be pulling this board out, as it's quite difficult and honestly extremely tedious to work in this system, but the layout is roughly the same. The ECS does not use barrel batteries. In fact, it doesn't offer any onboard battery at all, and simply has a header for an external battery. Furthermore, it doesn't offer a curse slot, and you're stuck with DIPRAM on here. Otherwise, they're mostly the same in their features and specifications. The ECS seems to have been made just a little later. I do have twice as much cash installed on the ECS, but they're 20 nanosecond chips, and so we're going to have the latency turned up just a little bit. Today my working PCI 5 4ST is set up much like the original, it has the video card from that system and S3 Trio 32 which seems to score faster than most S3 Trio cards for some reason and it might be why I remember the system being fast. It also has a 90 MHz Pentium CPU installed and some other generic parts like a Yamaha sound card and a Realtek network card which will be swapped with the original Linksys I had in the old board before it died. There's no advantage to using one card over the other, once they're set up they basically work the same way but well that's how I had the system set up before and that's how I want it now. And as I kept the parts, why not? First things first, will this thing run blood? Yeah, it will. In fact, it'll do everything it should do, but we won't know quite how it stands if we don't compare it to something else. Let's go overboard with motherboards and throw five more boards into the mix to see what happens with those boards. Let's have a look at those quickly before we do anything else. Firstly is an ECS SI55P, the one from IK5. We've just seen this. It uses the same chipset, but it may be disadvantaged due to having 20 nanosecond cache chips installed. I'll have to roll things back ever so slightly as far as timings go to maintain coherency and this will hurt performance a little, and i found that installing more cache on motherboards often seems to damage performance just a little bit. Otherwise I think if they were configured identically, they'd probably score identically, although I don't know, the, the SI55P may be a little faster I, I suspect, and if I can ever get any faster cache chips we might have to test that out. I should mention that all of the boards that we will be testing today are going to be set up such that their timings are at least reasonably fast and nothing is installed but the bare essentials, the Trio 32 card, a flash card containing DOS and the required software. They will also have 32 megabytes of EDO RAM installed, the exact same modules to eliminate any bullshit between different memory. Next up is my old ECS TR5510 which replaced the original PCI54 ST when it died. The TR5510 also supports burst cache. It's a similarly aged motherboard. You can see ECS were leaning on the user installing curse modules instead of using DIP chips now, and that the board also uses the Intel 430FX chipset, which is from a little later than these SIS chipsets. It is a common chipset, and probably for good reasons, though today it seems you're more likely to find the later 430VX such as that found on the ECS P5VX. What is it with me and having boards with white slots? It's not just ECS boards, I seem to have a lot of these, they just fall into my hands for some reason. We will be testing this ECS P5VX. This board is obviously newer, it also features double the cache of the TR5510 and PCI 54ST at 512k, but it is burst cache. It is supposed to support SD RAM, but I've never had that working on a VX board, and I doubt it would really go any faster than EDO on them anyway. If I'm wrong, prove me wrong. There will be a wacky motherboard out there somewhere that sees a huge advantage, but I think that will be an exception to the rule. 
This motherboard has the sadly not so common feature of having dual voltages on board, so you can plug in real socket 7 chips without having to find obscure VRMs or interposers. Like most ECS boards, the onboard regulators are sufficient and are properly heat synced. Believe it or not, this is a problem on a good number of Socket 7 motherboards in that they either don't bother providing regulation at all, which basically renders them Socket 5 motherboards, or else they provide some form of voltage regulation that's not very good and runs far too hot, and I suspect made the board unstable might well have been the cause of stability issues people complained about on cheaper computers in the 1990s, especially those running Cyrix chips as those draw a lot of power. The PC chips M520 also features the Intel 430VX chipset, we will be testing this motherboard as well today. Of course it has similar features to the P5VX, though only a single voltage on board and the regulators do get worryingly hot most of the time, remember what I was saying just moments ago. However this is largely here just to prove that PC chips did make a good board and that I wasn't lying to you all the times I've said that. Also that passive VRM card is from my original TMC motherboard. My M520 is slightly broken, but that's due to idiot human intervention because you can't trust other people with your stuff. I expect it will be faster than the CIS motherboards at the very least. Should be as it was made considerably later. Lastly is the Chaintech 5VGM. These used to be common motherboards once upon a time, but I haven't seen any around in the wild for quite a long time, which is a shame because they were genuinely quite good. This is another 430VX board, it does have dual voltage on board and it's really well made despite looking kinda crap. It runs cold too. This is here for two reasons, to round off the charts and to help make a point I want to make about these things later on. It seems Chaintech were a little smarter than the other vendors as they simply stuffed 256k of cash on the board and didn't bother putting that seemingly useless SD RAM slot on there. Good for them, I approve of that, nobody ever seems to have complained about this decision, I think it's fucking brilliant personally. Incidentally, this board will be tested with automatically selected timings, but those are fairly fast anyway, and any gains we'd have by adjusting them would be rather minimal. Otherwise, the board genuinely is quite unremarkable, which may well be one of its most remarkable features. It looks boring, it works boring, but maybe boring is best. Only time will tell. I'm not going to read you the results, I'll do some big grids of all the tests running as we'd be here all year and really the scores are going to be quite close, let alone I don't want to think about the rendering times that I would have to incur to do this. I'll just give you a brief summary of what's going on, but I'll tell you before we get started I'm about to make you rue the day that you turned your back on PC chips and ECS, because a lot of people seem to regard both of them as cheap trash that's not worth bothering with, well... Both of them are truly capable of making some decent hardware, the latter still are as far as I'm aware. So in 3D Bench, the PC chips M520 takes the lead. The ECS TR5510 comes in as the fastest of the pre-VX boards, and the TMC is the slowest, around 12 points behind the PC chips and the TR5510. It's nice to see the slower cache isn't hitting the SI55P too hard, as that still comes out ahead of the PCI54ST by a point and a half. In PC Player there's not much in it, but the ECS P5VX takes this one. We would expect the VX boards to lead most of the time, so for the older boards the TR5510 leads again over the CIS models here. In fact the SI55P is the slowest, but that's probably the cache penalty taking effect, as from what we've seen with PC Player in the past it's a little sensitive to that, at least as far as I can remember, and it's not too huge of a hit, so that's definitely a possibility. Top Bench breaks a trend by having the SI55P come out on top, a nice win for these older SIS chipsets that have been around since the Socket 4 days. These would have probably been meant to compete with the LX and NX chipset, that in Mercury and Neptune, which had very slow memory and cache timings that couldn't be adjusted among many other issues. I can guarantee you the SIS chips are faster than those, but unfortunately I don't own boards which have those. I do have a Mercury board around somewhere, but that's really not worth bothering with. On the other hand, the PCI54ST is still the slowest in top bench, only by a mere three points. This is so little that it may well simply be within the margins for error, and I'm going to ignore it. There are only five points between the slowest and fastest board here today, with 260 being the average, so... 
yeah, it's really not worth worrying about. We could probably actually get that back with some very small tweaks to things. Speed Sys raises an interesting discrepancy between CPU scores. They all score 66 point something, so you'd never notice in reality, and it can likely be accounted to slightly different clock generators on each board. It could be that they're off by a few kilohertz in general, or else the temperature was different from one test to the next, which affected said clock in such ways. It's never going to be enough to make any real difference, but this can drift slightly depending on environmental factors, and if we measure the CPU speed with CPU check, well, you can see that some of them drift down to 89 point odd, and some drift up to 90 point odd, and that might just be enough to affect the score. Meanwhile, memory bandwidth is greatest on the M520, it's worst on the SI55P though, that could be the cash penalty again. I doubt it is so much as the PCI54ST is the next slowest of the older boards, and lags a whole 10 meg behind the TR5510. Interestingly, the PCI54ST does have faster access to the VGA card than any of the other boards, and the M520 is the slowest in this test. Given how blood used to lag in DOSBox when certain things happened on the screen, largely due to poor visa emulation at the time, it might explain why I remember the previous TMC board running it so well. The difference is small, but it may be just enough that it kept the game from choking as hard as it otherwise would. The TR5510 is the second fastest here, so overall this is a win for the older motherboards. L1 cache is close again, but the M520 is a half faster than all the others, whilst the SI55P is the slowest. The TR5510 continues to lead the scores for the older motherboards. L2 cache is much of the same story, the M520 is fastest, and no surprises the SI55P is the slowest, which figures due to the extra weights we've had to introduce into that. The PCI54ST is the second slowest, with the TR5510 again being the faster of the older boards. I guess that burst cache mode really helps out, by just 12 megs per second, so not much. Not enough that you'd likely notice it on either board, but although the Intel chipsets we're testing here have this feature, and it is turned on, whereas the Sys chipsets just don't offer it yet. At this point, I'd like to note that we've not once mentioned that chain tech, not yet. And that trend continues with memory throughput. The M520 tramples the competition. The SI55P comes in last again, and the TR5510 is the fastest of the older boards once more. Now, if you've taken all that in, the P5VX is faster at Doom than the other boards. The PCI54ST is the slowest. The TR5510 continues to be the faster of the older boards here. All of the boards score between 46 and 51 frames per second, though, so the differences are still small, especially when you consider this is calculated as an average over the course of the entire time demo. Losing barely 5 frames a second on average in that time, are you really going to notice it? I don't know, probably not. Quake also runs faster on the P5VX, and it's the slowest on the PCI54ST. The TR5510 is still the fastest older board, but the gap is tiny on these, with scores ranging from around 21 to 23.5 frames a second. Again, this is over the course of the whole demo, so you're losing barely more than 2 frames a second on average. It's interesting though how as soon as we stop using synthetic benchmarks and use actual games, the tables turn in favour of the P5VX, and even the old CIS boards stop lagging behind as much as you'd think they would. In fact, once we reach blood and sit still in the starting area, it's hard to see any difference at all. The range is literally between 40 and 42 frames a second, with the P5VX being the only board able to reach 42. Both CIS boards will average around 40, and all other boards, they sit at around 41. Again, would you notice? I don't think so. However, there's an interesting little difference, and it's very subtle, but if we let the demo run, the PCI54ST seems to simply shrug off the texture loads versus some of the other boards that do have a mild stutter. The effect's very slight, it's hard to notice, but perhaps the faster PCI excess we noticed with the VGA card also affects the IDE on this board. Perhaps it's simply wired in a way that the PCI bus is marginally quicker here, and that's why I remember it running as well as I do. Maybe it's just the nostalgia glasses, who knows for sure, but there does seem to be a subtle difference here, it's extremely small. 
I guess what we can take away from this is that synthetic benchmarks don't really mean all that much, and most motherboards seem to be reasonably capable, as I've said before, and should only be used as a general indicator, a ballpark figure at best, and you should always have a decent sample size to hand with multiple tests, if at all possible. It seems most motherboards from between 1994 and 1997 for the Socket 5 and 7 platform are about equally as capable though, so we've also figured that out today. Now the burning question, is the PCI 54ST actually all that fast? Well no, not really, but it's not slow either, it's capable enough. Both the ones I have were used in systems that acted as servers in a past life, and I can't help suspect that they might have been on shelves earlier than the other boards I have here, competing with other server boards. There's been early Socket 5 implementations rather than been around later and taking on the likes of the TR5510. Still, regardless of what the benchmarks might lead you to believe, it's not exactly painfully slow, and after using it for a good while, I can certainly report that it's stable and doesn't exhibit any real quirks outside of its physical design being a little bit unusual versus the boards you usually see. It doesn't look as weird when you see it next to older Socket 5 boards like the Intel Plato though, which again I suspect was where it was meant to compete and that it simply predates the other test subjects that we have here today. There's also the fact that it was up against generally good boards today, all of which were made later on, and the only other board on the same chipset is being hit by a slow cache. It still managed to outrun the PCI 54 ST in a few places, so it probably would be faster if I had the faster cache installed, and if I disable parity on the memory as, well, that's on on both of these boards, and I left it on on there, I guess I probably should turn it off. Still, it's nice to have that in the table, as it's not an unrealistic scenario that something might be running that way with the slower cache and memory parity on. Incidentally, I don't appear to be able to turn parity off on the PCI 5.4 ST, further lending to the likelihood of it being server hardware. Now that point I want to make, well, the chain tech is probably the best board here. I love the ECS boards and I like the PC chips M520, but that chain tech is probably the most capable and least quirky of the bunch. It doesn't have heat issues or compatibility issues, nor does it need obscure parts, nor is it likely to have parts break down, and if I could find the original RTC chip in the drawer, it would have a coin battery for the RTC instead of one of those stupid Dallas modules, and it is socketed anyway. Also, it supports more processors than most of them right out of the box. It's not the fastest, and it's not the slowest. It's a middle-of-the-road board for its time as far as performance goes, and I found that with chain tech boards in general. They rarely top the scores, but they just work. Likewise, I suspect the PCI 5.4 ST is middle of the road for its time, but I simply don't any other boards which are old enough to have a large enough sample size. This and the SI55P also have parity enabled for the RAM, where the other boards don't, and I can't find a way to turn this off on the PCI 5.4 ST, which further points to it being meant for the server market before Socket 5 found its way into smaller systems and the consumer market. The board has other limits, such as not really supporting the K5 all that well, and they'll identify as a 5K86, but the later models weren't identified properly at all, basically from the point when they switched to using a PR rating that didn't reflect the actual clock, and also the voltage regulator is too small. It's not likely an oversight in the design, as the CPUs simply didn't exist yet when they were coming up with this motherboard. The PCB only has jumper settings printed for up to 150MHz Pentium CPUs, and I suspect that was speculative as the die shrink for that almost certainly hadn't happened yet. The 100MHz model would likely be the fastest on the market at the board's release. Certainly nothing higher than the 133 would have been out, and the 166 was nothing but a distant thought of what was to come. As the buyer speculates, a 160 and 180 megahertz model beyond the 133. We can cheat the system though. The board does have an undocumented 3 times multiplier available, and it does offer a 66 megahertz front side bus. Fun fact: that clock generator can actually achieve 80 megahertz if we were to add that unpopulated jumper there, which might explain the 160 megahertz CPU they thought might come to exist. But still. With what we have, 3.0 times 66 megahertz, 
200 megahertz is certainly possible on this board and that means the IDT wind chip will work in here. The motherboard has no idea what this chip is, thinking it's a 66 megahertz nothing CPU. And it starts just fine, and because the wind chip is low power and single voltage, nothing gets hot nor struggles to supply enough juice. It does offer a speed boost, and it offers MMX instructions, whatever those are useful for. Guess you could play a pod and remind yourself just how devoid of personality that game is. Granted, it's essentially a 486 in disguise now. Seriously, stop fucking around with those 5x86 chips and put one of these in a Super Socket 7 board if you want the world's fastest 486. But nonetheless, despite the grief the wind chip gets, I think it has a niche here that was never fully realised. Because there's the problem, people look at the wind chip as if it were a Super Socket 7 chip, when in fact it's single voltage, 3.52 volts. It only wants a 66 MHz front side bus. Therefore, really it's a Socket 5 chip, and it offers a substantial upgrade for older, more limited systems such as this one. Now, I'm going to go back to the Pentium 90 on this motherboard when I'm done here, but it's kind of cool to see how much of a difference this thing makes, and to make the motherboard do something it almost certainly wasn't ever meant to do. Although this CPU really isn't very good at Quake, it barely breaks 23 frames a second, which we know the P5VX was doing with the P90. Although the wind chip doesn't have a very strong floating point unit, so... Well, that was to be expected, and otherwise it offers something like a 50% improvement almost everywhere else, if not more. If I'd had a system like this at the time of the wind chip's release, I would certainly have considered installing one. Granted, a Pentium 200 would likely have been faster, and I'm sure one would work in this board, but a Pentium 200 would have cost more, and it might have been harder to find. Incidentally, we can go the other way and set the FSB to 33 MHz. This isn't documented, and it probably isn't very useful, but, well, we now have a 50 MHz Pentium, I guess. Well, that was completely fucking aimless. What did we learn today? We learnt that it probably doesn't really matter which motherboard you use all that much. You can get bragging rights for benchmarks on some of them, but it doesn't really make that much tangible difference in games, so what's the point? I can't speak for motherboards on other chipsets. There were motherboards on Opti chipsets, for example. I don't know how those perform, I don't know if those are reliable. And that's the thing. It got me to thinking, I'm like, well, you know what? The PC chips M520 is a pretty good motherboard. But it is a bit quirky, it's, uh, you know, it's a cheap board, and you can tell the, the quality is not quite as good as some of the others. Uh, and I'm like, well, that bench is faster, but I mean, the P5VX beat it in games, didn't it? Uh, that TMC that I tried building my K6 on, that newer one, that bench really fast, and it worked very well. That DFI Enforce 2 board I had for my Athlon. Years ago, that bench real fast, it didn't work very well. You know, so a lot of them are AMD boards. I've said before, AMD processors seem to get stuck in shit motherboards, and it's a total waste. The motherboard for my Athlon 64 benched stupid fast. Like, that system, you would have you believe in pass mark, you'd get like this huge gain. It was something ridiculous, like at least 30% faster than my Pentium D. Yeah, like, fuck, you'd never see that. It was slower than my Pentium D, and it wasn't fucking reliable. And that was an ECS motherboard, and I like ECS. So, what was wrong with that one? That's the only bad one I've had. I don't count the K7S5, that's technically a PC chip sport. Was it N830 or something? I can't remember. But, yeah, I, I, I'm like, you know, fucking these faster benching boards, I guess, are the worst. <laughs> I wager that PCI54ST, yeah, it doesn't bench the fastest. And I, like I said, I think parity memory stuck on on that, and that's going to be damaging it. I really do think it was probably a server board. It probably compete with, like, Intel Platos and shit would be its contemporaries, and I'm sorry, I don't have anything that old. But, I mean, it's not a huge gap between them, is it, with these newer ones? It's still pretty convincing. You, wouldn't, you really wouldn't notice. I bet that one will live probably longer than most of the other ones. The next best one, I would say, is the chain tech, if not the best. I mean, yeah, it's very similar to the PC chips M520, but like, unlike a lot of other boards from its time, it doesn't promise features it can't deliver, like the SD RAM slot or stupid cache upgrades nobody was ever going to fucking bother with. It just fucking works. It benches middle of the road. It performs adequately. It 
wax with everything I've ever put in there is stable. I've been mean to it, for fuck's sake. That TerraTech sound card, I repaired it in this board and I shorted shit out. It didn't car. It doesn't car. It still wax. You know, it's, uh, yeah, go for a middle of the road board. <laughs> it's probably the best thing. Uh, they, they seem to be the ones that, that work. Because, I mean, the TMC is quirky. It's, it's not as easy to configure and th there are some limits to what it can do, obviously, so I, I can't say that's the best one. The chain tech, I think, is the best out of all these bolts. Even though it's not the fastest, it's not the slowest, it's definitely, I think, the best of them. But if you have a PC Chips M520 in your machine, to be honest, I don't think you can go wrong. I wouldn't go rushing out to change it. It's pretty fucking good, all things considered. I quite like the M520. It's a good little board. You know, it has, has some quacks. It, it's, it's a bit cheap, but fine, there's nothing wrong with it really, is it? If it's working, leave it alone. It'll do its job just fine. Just enjoy it for as long as it lasts. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Uh, yeah, so I don't know, man. It, it doesn't seem to matter what motherboard you use. Uh, as usual, never works for you, I guess, as I've said many, many times. I don't know when I'll be back, because I'm probably going to be looking after mice again. Oh, what's that shit about best load plans and mice and men, because I mean, I, I always have shit planned, but it never seems to work out quite as expected. I do have something planned. I mean, April's coming up. I always do something in April. So I don't really know. I'll, I'll try, but as, as always, I can't promise. And you might notice that PCI54ST, we haven't seen that with its lid on. I guess we'll do that now. I'll, I'll hand you over to uh, the dude it actually belongs to. I'm just renting it. Hallo, ich bin Klaus und das ist mein Reichputer. Ja, das ist Uber. Schnell! Deutsches Engineering ist überlegen. Ja, as you can see, that machine vastly superior to anything built by the Jew who runs this channel. I don't even have to remove the lid to show you. It should just emanate its superiority into the room, through your screen. Also allow me to apologize, I've not lost my strange accent, despite not living at my home country for many years. But it makes me appear interesting to unsuspecting people on the outside. Because otherwise I have the personality of cardboard. Also I have no face, except that. That's just my face. Yeah, I'm under strict instructions never to show you the inside of this machine. The information technological secrets contained within might be used by spies. That's just all, us. Yeah, well, if you must know, probably going to paint it black. But I had some red paint left, and the thing was, basically, I had like five of those cases. One had a fucked up bezel, one had a fucked up lid, another had a fucked up tray. It doesn't line up. And if you look inside the machine, you'd see it does. Things don't line up right with the card slots. And there's like a huge gap there. And, you know, I'm like, well, let's have a laugh. You know, let's put all the busted pieces together. And let's paint it like that and just fucking have a laugh with it. And, you know, if that bothers you, well, I'm not apologising. Fuck you, grow up, get a sense of humour. I'm not saying you have to find it funny, but people just don't fucking laugh anymore. And that's just sad. Like, if you don't laugh, what are you going to do? Are you going to cry? Like, <laughs> what do you got left? What's the point? And I'm probably, anyway, I'm gonna, probably going to paint it black. Ah, black, you see, it can't be a Nazi, can it? I'm probably going to paint it black, it was the plan all along, sand it down, paint it black, but, well, it was fun while it lasted. And, you know, you got to do these things, you got to fucking do these things, and post it on forums that you shouldn't be on. Uh, why the hell not? I mean, what they're going to do, ban me? Oh shit, I'm already banned. Oops! <laughs> Anyways, I I'm definitely getting out of here now. Uh, am I treason? Thanks for watching. Oh, remember, don't be a screw up, Lord Dust 622 up. Whilst we're experimenting, here's a video card I mentioned some time ago, the Trident TGOI 9440-1. I can't speak for all 9440 chips, but certainly this model isn't bad. People will often ignore Trident cards and try to find Sang, then S3, then Cirrus, but you don't really need to do that. This thing will catch up to the Cirrus, and it can be had cheaper. For now at least, the hurry up, because I think people are starting to notice. Is it as fast as the S3? Hell no. 
Not at all. But it's not really slowing the system down in general and everything's still playable with it. You're really not going to be missing out all that much. In fact, some diamond branded S3 cards are probably slower than this thing because diamond cards really don't seem to perform all that well and not compared to their off-brand counterparts. I don't know why, I'm going to have to test that further, but it's a recurring pattern I've noticed. By complete accident, I might add, so I might have to look into that in the future. Incidentally, these Trident cards I have are Pine branded. Pine also sold the PC chips M520 I have as the PT7502. Pine is now called XFX. Yeah, remember Pine sold PC chips parts the next time you want to buy one of their video cards. Incidentally, I've never had an XFX branded card that worked properly, but these Tridents seem to work. Now, if you want one of these, you may have to search them out in depth, or even wait a while for somebody to list one cheap, but they do still show up cheap from time to time. See if you're stuck for a VGA card for a, a Pentium 1 or a 486, and you're on a tight budget, well, something like this may well be the card for you. Sure, it's not quite as fast, but the speed and compatibility really aren't half bad. Obviously, the DAC on them isn't the best. You're not going to get, like, workstation-grade video signals, but it's definitely usable, and... Well, as you can see, you're not really losing that much speed. You're probably going to forget about it pretty fast when you're halfway through Doom or Duke Nukem 3D or whatever you want to do with it.